Crystal McDowell's life was full of challenges from the very beginning. Born to parents who had given her a name inspired by difficult circumstances, she faced a tough childhood. Her parents, who both passed away within six months of each other when Crystal was just 11 years old, succumbed to health complications. This tragic loss left Crystal an orphan, forcing her to fend for herself. During her teenage years, Crystal encountered further hardships. She was abducted and held captive for several days, but she displayed incredible strength and resilience, ultimately escaping her captor. Eventually, she made her way to Baytown, Texas, where she found refuge with her aunt and uncle. Despite her painful experiences, Crystal was determined to build a better life. She worked tirelessly to overcome her struggles and leave her past behind. In Baytown, Crystal met Steve McDowell. Steve, known for his playful personality and love for video games and fast cars, quickly won her over with his sweet and funny demeanor. Crystal's friends noticed how happy she seemed with Steve and believed they made a perfect couple. Crystal worked as a flight attendant with ExpressJet, allowing her and Steve to travel frequently and enjoy the perks of her job. After they married, they had two children, Madden and Maui. Crystal was a dedicated mother who prioritized her children's happiness and well-being. From the outside, it appeared that Crystal, Steve, and their children were the ideal family. However, beneath the surface, Crystal was becoming increasingly dissatisfied with her marriage. After a decade, she decided to end her relationship with Steve, a decision that he strongly resisted. While Crystal waited for the keys to her new home, which was being remodeled, she continued to live with Steve and their children a challenging situation as they managed the emotions surrounding the impending divorce. By 2017, Crystal had turned 37 and had made significant changes in her life, including a career shift to real estate. She was looking forward to a new chapter in her life and a fresh start in her new home. On August 25, 2017, Crystal planned to meet her family to watch the Mayweather vs. McGregor fight. Excitement was in the air as friends and family gathered for the much-anticipated event. However, Crystal never showed up. Initially, her absence didn't raise alarm as her family thought she might be running late or handling other responsibilities. But as the night progressed without any response to calls or messages, concern grew. After more than 24 hours without contact, her family made the difficult decision to report her missing to the Chambers County Sheriff's Department. A deputy was immediately dispatched to Crystal's home, where he questioned her ex-husband, Steve. Steve informed the detectives that Crystal had started a new relationship after their separation and mentioned that sometimes she would go out without telling him her whereabouts. As he spoke, the deputy's intuition hinted at something unusual in Steve's tone. With mounting suspicion, he called for backup and an experienced detective arrived to assist. The detective noticed that Steve was still wearing his wedding band, a detail that piqued his interest, especially since they had been divorced for six months. Although Steve cooperated, there was something in his demeanor that felt off. Due to the unusual circumstances, the detective involved the district attorney, who after reading the reports, suspected foul play. The district attorney found it notable that despite being divorced, Crystal and Steve were still living together and Crystal had started a new relationship. With suspicions on high alert, the DA ordered further investigation. The detective, however, was open to other possibilities and considered that Crystal's new boyfriend might have insights into her disappearance. The investigation revealed that the man Crystal had last seen on August 24, 2017, was Paul Hargrave, a local jewelry store manager. According to Paul, he and Crystal spent the night together, and in the morning, while he was in the shower, Crystal left his home. Paul provided security footage showing Crystal leaving his residence in her black Mercedes coupe on August 25 at 7.35 a.m., with both Steve McDowell and Paul Hargrave as key figures in the case, detectives continued to search for other potential leads as they worked to uncover the truth behind Crystal's disappearance. They uncovered some intriguing details about the case. They discovered some intriguing details about Crystal's marriage. It was found that throughout her marriage, Crystal had been involved in multiple relationships outside of her marriage with flight crew members, both male and female. The discovery of these relationships raised suspicions among the detectives. They wondered if there was a possibility that a distressed partner had sought to harm Crystal out of revenge. However, there was no evidence linking these relationships to her disappearance. The investigation into Crystal's disappearance stalled when Hurricane Harvey struck Baytown. This massive storm caused widespread devastation, submerging half the county in floodwaters. The heavy rain persisted for days, 
complicating the investigation's progress. Crystal's disappearance was soon overshadowed by the hurricane and its aftermath as people lost their homes, vehicles, and even their lives in the storm's destruction. The Chambers County Sheriff's Department, faced with limited resources, had to redirect all personnel to hurricane-related search and rescue efforts. With the officers who were supposed to work on Crystal's case diverted to the hurricane response, her family took up the investigation. Friends and family members spent days tirelessly sharing posts about Crystal's disappearance on various social media platforms, including Facebook and Instagram. They spread the word far and wide, hoping to gather any leads or information that might reveal her whereabouts. One of Crystal's cousins received a message from a friend who informed them of a recent Snapchat image showing Crystal's vehicle parked at a Motel 6 near Interstate 10. Intrigued by this claim, Crystal's cousin immediately sought to verify the information. After viewing the Snapchat image, they recognized the license plate and confirmed it was indeed Crystal's car. With this confirmation, Crystal's cousin quickly informed her family and the police of the potential lead. However, severe flooding in Chambers County made it challenging to reach the motel. Instead of traditional vehicles, they used airboats to navigate through the flooded areas. Upon arriving at Motel 6, Crystal's family and the police were confronted with a sight that confirmed their worst fears. Her car was parked haphazardly in the parking lot with the keys still in the ignition, it appeared that whoever had left Crystal's car there intended for it to be stolen. The vehicle was then towed to the crime lab garage for processing, but regrettably, no evidence was found that could provide any clues about Crystal's whereabouts. Even Dateline, the popular news television investigation series, dedicated segments to Crystal's disappearance. Unfortunately, these efforts did not yield any relevant information. A week after Crystal's disappearance, a detective realized he needed additional help, especially given the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. He reached out to the Texas Rangers, who gladly offered their assistance. The lead Texas Ranger assigned to the case conducted the first formal interview with Steve McDowell, Crystal's husband. Steve stated that he had not seen Crystal since she left for her outing on August 24th. From the very beginning, Steve's body language appeared unusual to the Ranger. Despite Crystal's sudden disappearance, Steve did not display the deep worry one would expect in such a situation. However, Crystal's friends and family continued to support Steve. They knew Steve personally and felt he could not be responsible for Crystal's disappearance, emphasizing his loving nature as a father to Madden and Maui and doubting he would ever do anything to harm their mother. The ranger approached Steve and asked if he would take a lie detector test. Steve agreed, appearing confident in his innocence. However, the test results were surprising Steve failed the test, raising even more questions about his involvement in Crystal's disappearance. Paul Hargrave, Crystal's boyfriend and also a person of interest, took a polygraph test as well. Like Steve, Paul did not pass the test, adding further complexity to the investigation. The detector led the district attorney to start questioning whether there was a possible joint effort to hide the truth about Crystal's disappearance. By this stage, everyone involved was convinced that foul play was a factor and that Crystal was no longer alive. However, one crucial question remained unanswered, where was her body? If her remains had been disposed of in one of the bayous in Baytown, there was a high chance her body could have been carried to the Gulf of Mexico, making recovery nearly impossible. In an effort to locate Crystal and bring closure to her family, a search was organized that included Texas search and rescue teams and local volunteers. The search took place on September 9th, with close to 100 people joining the search efforts. The search teams adopted a grid-based approach, dividing the area into sections and covering each by foot, ATV, and airboat. Despite the extensive efforts by everyone involved, no trace of crystal was found. As the search continued into the wetlands, the Texas Rangers remained determined to identify those responsible for crystal's disappearance. They worked tirelessly to piece together the events and explore possible motives behind her disappearance. One potential lead was that her ex-husband or her boyfriend could have been involved, though no evidence was found to confirm this theory. Recognizing the importance of CCTV footage, the rangers canvassed the area around the motel where her car was discovered, searching for any nearby homes or businesses with security cameras. Fortunately, several establishments had cameras and the rangers were intent on uncovering any footage that might shed light on Crystal's disappearance. After sifting through countless hours of footage, 
the Rangers found footage of a person parking Crystal's car in the motel lot on Saturday, August 26, at 6.37 a.m. Although the footage showed a clear image of the man, the Rangers couldn't immediately identify him. Continuing their analysis, they observed that the man exited Crystal's Mercedes and walked away from the vehicle. Suspicion grew that this individual could be Crystal's ex-husband Steve, prompting the Rangers to focus more intently on this lead. In a separate video captured five hours later by another security camera, a blue car, identified as a rare Mustang GT, pulled into a gas station near the motel. This car matched the description of Steve McDowell's vehicle, reinforcing the Rangers' belief that Steve could have been the one seen parking Crystal's car at the motel. Steve's behavior at the gas station raised suspicion. Instead of refueling, he walked toward the motel parking lot, seemingly checking on Crystal's car. The Rangers speculated that Steve might have returned to the lot earlier to see if anyone had taken the car, as he had reportedly left the keys in the ignition, possibly hoping someone would steal it. If Steve was responsible for her disappearance, however, how did he get back home? The distance between where he left Crystal's car and his home was considerable, making it unlikely he could have walked. To investigate further, the Rangers reviewed CCTV footage from surrounding businesses and residences, hoping to find more clues. During this review, they discovered footage of a man riding a distinctive bike with mag wheels in the rain along the I-10 service road at 7.05 a.m., about 25 minutes after Crystal's car was left at the motel. The bike's unique features reminded the Rangers of a similar one they had seen in the McDowell garage during one of their interviews with Steve. In one of these interviews, Steve had mentioned that he had gone to a local store on Saturday morning. Intrigued, the Rangers checked footage from the store, which was situated across from the motel. The footage revealed a curious sequence of events a man resembling Steve arrived at the store in a hooded sweatshirt and paid cash for a bike with mag wheels, just minutes after Crystal's car was abandoned at the motel. With the evidence gathered, the Ranger decided to summon Steve back to the police department for a follow-up interview. During their encounter, the Ranger presented Steve with all the evidence they had collected against him. However, Steve denied any involvement in Crystal's disappearance. Despite his denial, the Ranger remained convinced that Steve was responsible. The Ranger was confident that Paul Hargrave was innocent and believed Steve was solely accountable for Crystal's disappearance. While the Ranger thought they had enough evidence to charge Steve, they were missing one critical piece Crystal's body. The absence of physical remains hindered efforts to build a strong case against him. One key reason the district attorney Da wanted to find Crystal's body was to secure a guilty verdict. Without a body, proving a charge can be more challenging, as it often relies on circumstantial evidence and witness statements. Having physical evidence would strengthen the DA's case and provide solid proof for a jury. Additionally, locating Crystal's remains was crucial for her family's well-being. Her loved ones deserved closure and needed answers about what had happened to her. The lack of answers was causing immense distress, and finding Crystal's remains would provide some relief and bring answers to their lingering questions. Another factor influencing the DA's decision to locate Crystal's body was a series of concerning statements Steve had made. People had informed the Texas Ranger that after Crystal filed for separation, Steve made alarming comments. The Ranger and the DA were also worried about the safety of Crystal and Steve's children, Madden and Maui. Given the potential risks, the DA decided to remove the children from their father's custody and place them in protective services. To encourage Steve's cooperation, the DA presented him with an offer. They indicated that if he led them to Crystal's location, they might reconsider allowing him visitation with his children. However, Steve responded with a different proposal. He requested to go home that night, promising that the next morning he would share everything and lead them to Crystal's location. This request created a dilemma for the DA. On one hand, it offered a chance to potentially uncover the truth. On the other, it depended on Steve's reliability and cooperation with only a verbal agreement. Ultimately, the district attorney allowed Steve to return home, understanding the risk involved. There was a chance that Steve might leave or act against himself, leaving Crystal's fate unresolved. However, the next morning, on September 9th, the DA and the Texas Ranger arrived at Steve's home. Steve answered the door, and during the interview, he shared his version of events. Steve revealed that he was aware of Crystal's infidelities throughout their marriage. 
When he confronted her about these issues, Crystal Report reportedly told him that she had sought other relationships because she felt there were unmet needs in the relationship. As the Ranger and DA asked about the day Crystal went missing, they used a sympathetic approach to encourage Steve to share more. The Ranger showed empathy to help Steve feel more at ease, hoping he would reveal what truly happened on that day. Eventually, Steve admitted that before her disappearance, he and Crystal had a heated argument. Crystal told Steve she no longer loved him, leading to a confrontation. In a moment of anger, Steve admitted to an impulsive reaction that led to her passing. However, he claimed that he never intended to harm her and that the incident was purely accidental. Following Crystal's passing, Steve took immediate action to conceal her remains. Steve confessed that he wrapped her body in trash bags and placed it in the trunk of her car. He then drove to a secluded location where he disposed of Crystal's body in a ravine. Steve's willingness to lead the authorities to Crystal's body seemed to offer a glimmer of hope in an otherwise bleak situation. However, there was a catch he stipulated that the death penalty be removed as a viable option in exchange for leading them to her remains. The district attorney, mindful of the difficulty of finding Crystal's body without Steve's cooperation, reluctantly agreed to his request. To unravel the mystery surrounding Crystal's disappearance, Steve accompanied the ranger and the DA on the search. The path was Needle Point Road, a narrow street nestled amidst heavily wooded land. Eventually, the ranger came upon Crystal's body. When it was found, the condition of the body was horrifying barely anything was left. After Steve was arrested and charged with Crystal's death, it was revealed that Steve's defense team aimed to claim the Sudden Passion Clause as a defense. This strategy allowed Steve and his team to blame Crystal's death on her alleged provocation, potentially reducing or dropping the charges altogether. In Texas, sudden passion refers to a state of mind characterized by intense emotions such as anger or distress that overwhelm an individual, leading to impulsive and clouded thinking. To qualify for the sudden passion defense, the defendant must prove that the victim's provocation directly led to their actions. If Steve and his legal team succeed in presenting this defense, the charge could be classified as a second-degree felony, carrying a sentence of 2 to 20 years in prison and a fine of up to $10,000. On the other hand, if convicted of first-degree murder, Steve would face a harsher penalty, with the possibility of serving 5 to 99 years in prison and a fine of up to $10,000. The sudden passion defense in Crystal's case sparked a debate among legal scholars and societal stakeholders. Critics argued that this defense strategy effectively blamed the victim for their own fate, disregarding the perpetrator's guilt. Supporters of the defense argued that it provides an outlet for individuals to take responsibility for their actions while still acknowledging mitigating circumstances. However, the DA believed that this was a clear case of premeditated murder. In order for the decision to be upheld, all 12 jurors needed to agree on this as well. After a year of pre-trial hearings and motions, Steve's trial finally began in June 2019. The prosecution presented their case, aiming to convince the jury that Steve was indeed responsible for Crystal's death. One key piece of evidence presented was Steve's confession to the authorities. This confession provided crucial information helping to establish his guilt. Furthermore, the prosecution presented CCTV footage of Steve parking Crystal's car in the motel parking lot. In a heart-wrenching moment, Crystal and Steve's children were brought in to testify. Steve and Crystal's now seven-year-old daughter, Maui, took the stand and described to the jury what she witnessed the night her mother was killed. According to Maui, her parents were engaged in a heated argument about Crystal being with another person. She testified that during the fight, she saw her father place his hands over her mother's nose and mouth. Maui stated that she witnessed her mother struggling to breathe and eventually losing consciousness. After her mother stopped moving, Maui claimed that her father told her to stay inside her bedroom and not to tell anybody about what she had just witnessed. Maui explained to the court that she felt frightened and confused by what happened. In stark contrast to Maui's testimony, Steve's defense put forth a different version of events. They claimed that Maui learned about her mother's passing from Crystal's relatives and created a fabricated story around it. The defense argued that Maui was repeating what she had been told and was not a reliable witness. Although defense attorneys advised against it, Steve ultimately took the stand in his own defense, recounting the events that led to the tragic situation with tears streaming down his face. Steve presented a completely different version of events than what he told detectives during his confession. According to Steve, 
the night crystal passed away and folded in a sudden and unforeseen event. What started as a heated argument spiraled out of control, leading to an impulsive decision on his part. Frustrated, upset, and mad, Steve claimed that he resorted to violence in an attempt to calm her down, in a misguided effort to defuse the situation. He placed Crystal in a bear hug, hoping to restrain her and bring her back to a state of rationality. However, what happened next took him by surprise. Steve claimed Crystal suddenly went limp in his arms. Steve testified that he had no idea what had happened, stating that he had never intended to harm her intentionally. The district attorney, hearing Steve's testimony, was left stunned. To the DA, the idea that he'd effectively hugged Crystal to death seemed unfathomable. It was an unprecedented allegation that left the courtroom in disbelief. As the case went to the jury, the DA found himself worrying about the possibility of a mistrial. The jury's request to review Steve's confession video further heightened these concerns. A mistrial would mean starting the entire process over again, a prospect that weighed heavily on the prosecution's mind. One hour after the jury requested to see the footage, they returned and their verdict was delivered. Jurors found Steve guilty of murder, delivering justice for Crystal. This guilty verdict brought a measure of closure to her family and loved ones, who had been left searching for answers amidst the darkness that enveloped their lives. During the sentencing phase, the defense put forth the argument that Crystal's passing was a result of sudden passion, attempting to reduce the severity of Steve's punishment. However, the jury rejected this claim, choosing to uphold the severity of the crime. Steve was sentenced to serve a 50-year prison sentence, 